All right, hey guys, glad to be here. We get to find out if I trip over that during this. That should be, that should be fun, okay. I think I'm short enough that I can probably stand more or less in front of the TV and you can still see it. Um, so it, it, it's good to be here. Just, I, I know he can kind of ask some of these questions, but um, where are my like SaaS people again? Okay, my, how many of you guys are selling product, stuff? Anybody selling stuff? I don't know the correct terminology for any of these things. Like, you know. Um, so stuff, sellers. We got anybody doing anything where you're leveraging online, but you, got, you have more offline? Like a offline retail, anything like that? Really? What you got? Uh, we have a marketplace for talent, essentially. So Hire.com for welders, think of it that way. Nice. So there's a lot of an online sale of what you're getting, as well as the online component of like having people build profiles and stuff like that. Cool. So you got to talk to real human beings. Yeah, real people and everything. Very good. Uh, and what was yours? Digital sewing patterns. So we sell them online, but we also have a representation of the patterns in a shop. Digital sewing patterns. We should talk. I just bought sewing.com. Really? Yeah. Yep. We should talk. I know. We should. I mean that. If you have a card or give me something to write down with, because um, that, was, that was fortuitous. Um, so I'm going to talk about funnel optimization because that's what they asked me to talk about. Um, and I understand that Andre uh, a few days ago talked about funnel architecture. Is this correct? Um, so I, I got a chance to review what, what, everything that he talked about. I want to make sure that I don't uh, duplicate a lot of stuff. So if I get there and you're like, hey, we already talked about that, I'll move on. Uh, but I've, I've made sure that what I'm doing is building upon that. But it's safe to say pretty much everybody in this room should have a sense of what your funnel is, right? And by funnel, the way that I define funnel is how do we convert somebody from a total stranger into a friend, somebody who's kind of excited about what we're doing, into a customer, into a raving fan, into a promoter. That's kind of the way that I look at it. Uh, again, I don't know if that's the hip, cool. All, all the stuff out here is like hipster approved terminology that I don't know. So you know, if I use different lingo, let me know. Uh, but that's what we're talking about, right? Seamlessly and subtly leading a prospect towards a desired action. And what are the points of optimization along the way? Uh, that's what I want to chat about. Um, so I'll be really quick on the bio because I know you don't actually care that much. Um, I launched my first startup, if you can call it that, in 1999 um, from my dorm room at the University of Texas at Austin. Again, startup. Um, I just needed to make some extra dough. So I hired somebody to write an ebook on how to make baby food because I saw that people were searching on that in Google and there was nothing on it. So, like, let's sell a little ebook, a little PDF download on how to make baby food. All I wanted to do was make enough money. Uh, I met my freshman year, I met, this, I met this girl, and I knew a couple weeks in that she was probably the girl I was going to marry. Um, I didn't tell her that because that's creepy, but, and I'll get back to that later, right? Um, but I knew, right? Now, and I'm, bro you know, I'm broke college kid. This isn't like a rags to riches thing. You're supposed to be broke in college. Even if you're rich, you pretend like you're broke. Um, so, you know, but I need to make some extra money. So that's why I started doing this stuff. I never thought it would become really anything. Uh, it turned out it did become some stuff. Um, it was a real company and everything. I turned around, I was like, you know, I should maybe take this a little more seriously. Um, in uh, 2008, I, I made this attempt to aggregate all of my, all these different disparate companies under one holding company. I called it Idea Incubator. I thought it was a really clever name. I had no idea what an incubator actually was. Um, I just was like, this is where I can incubate all of my harebrained schemes. Um, and then people kept calling me like, oh, can I be in your incubator? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so then I learned what an incubator was. That was an exciting day for me. Now I wish that wasn't the name of the holding company. Um, founder and host of Traffic and Conversion Summit. That is next week. Is anybody here going to that, by the way? Very cool. See you there. Um, that, was, that was fun. Um, founder and CEO of DigitalMarketer.com and co-founder and executive chairman of nativecommerce.com. Native Commerce, um, these are some of, the, some of our brands. We have Survival Life, where we teach, you know, talk about survival and preparedness kind of stuff, DIY Ready, um, Pioneer Settler, which is like extreme gardening, um, and a, a number of e-com sites as well. This is not even remotely representative of all of them. Those were just the logos I could find. We have a couple hundred different properties in the digital media and e-commerce space. Uh, and we take all the cool stuff that we learn by running those companies and we report on it at Digital Marketer. Okay? So everything that I'm talking about here, just know 
it applies to all these different business models. We have lead gen companies, we have e-commerce companies, we have digital media companies. Uh, we just acquired a, a local retail business in Austin so that we can test an omni-channel strategy. Everything that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, applies. I don't care the type of business that you're in because last I checked, all of you are selling to human beings. It's critical that we remember that as we move forward. You're all selling to people. I don't care if you're B2B, B2C. So it's very appropriate to ask a question like, I don't quite see how what you just said applies to my business. That's fair. If we get to that point and, and you want to ask, we can talk through that. I would like for this to be fairly interactive. If you say that that won't work for me, that doesn't apply to my business, um, we will all point and laugh at you because you have been warned, okay? Because it does, all right? It does. So our goal over here is to craft a conversion funnel that lowers the cost of acquisition while simultaneously increasing the immediate and lifetime customer value. That's the goal. That's been my goal since day one. We still so far today have, have uh, done no funding. We've done no rounds. Um, we've been able to grow uh, all of our different companies uh, through bootstrapping and self-funding it because we acquire customers at a profit. I'll say that again, we acquire customers at a profit. So you see, if you do that, growth is profitable, right? Growth is profitable. You don't necessarily have to go out there and raise a bunch of money, or at least you can wait later on in the process. That's what I want for all of you. I know in every business it simply isn't possible, right? It simply isn't possible in all of them, but to the extent that it is, the longer you can wait to do some of these larger rounds, uh, the more equity you'll keep, the more control you'll get to have, all right? So that's the goal. How do we structure the experience such that you can acquire customers uh, at a profit? That's the goal. Since we're talking about optimization though, I wanna really bring up four main optimization points that I see when it comes to plugging leaky funnels. I'm gonna talk m mostly about messaging. Mostly about messaging, not so much the tactical aspects of send them to this page and then to that page, because that does vary a little bit from, from market to market, from product to product. I want to talk about messaging and really the areas uh, where I see that you can go in if you all have conversion funnels and, and make an impact, the areas that you should be testing. The first one is your sequence, right? Do you have an appropriate sequence? The messaging itself. What are your headlines on the different pages? What's the promise that you're making? And more importantly, what's a process that you can have in place so that your team can come up with the different messaging? So that how many of you guys are really, really great copywriters? Anybody? I'm gonna give you a structure for writing really good copy, okay? Because that, by the way, kind of a big deal, right? Do you, do you at least agree that you should maybe become a better copywriter? Does anybody think it's utterly unimportant? Okay, good. Commitment. How do you build micro-commitments into the process? How do you strategically build micro commitments into your funnel so that the funnel is a logical progression, right? It's a progression of the process that they began, right? You're not pushing them through, you're guiding them through. Micro commitments are what make that possible. We'll talk about that. And then little victories. How do you build little victories along the way that keep them motivated and that keep them hopeful? And we'll talk about some, some ways to not do that. So let's start with sequence. The, question, the big question you have to answer here is, does the funnel follow the same form and function of a normal, healthy human relationship? Normal, healthy human relationship. Now I mentioned before I met my wife my freshman year of college, I knew two weeks in that she was probably the girl that I wanted to marry, but I didn't tell her that because that's creepy. Now you all laughed because you all acknowledge, yes, that's freaking creepy. Right? And yet, isn't this kind of what we're doing oftentimes to our customers? Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you, you wanna get married? We do it all the time in business. We know it's not normal, right? The 12 stages of intimacy. Um, Desmond Morris, he's actually a zoologist, did some very interesting research about how intimacy happens, how intimate relationships occur, right? And he actually found, here's a, uh, just Google 12 stages of intimacy. Um, you probably all know how to use Google at this point. Um, and you'll find it. I don't necessarily recommend you read the book. Incidentally, when you do Google it, you're going to find uh, there are two groups 
that have really taken this concept of the 12 stages of intimacy and, and run with it. The first group is romance writers. Romance writers who want to know how to appropriately uh, describe a romantic interaction in a way that, that, that is you know, normal and, and that, is, that is expected. The other group are, are abstinence uh, courses. So it's very interesting, the divergence of, of uh, groups of this. But what Desmond Morris basically found out is that in every human interaction, there are 12 steps that for the most part are followed, right? Typically eye to body. I see you and I find you attractive. Eye to eye, interestingly enough, eye to eye contact is far more interesting than just gazing at the body, right? Then you have hand to hand, hand to body. Eventually you get to the point where you know, it gets a little PG-13, right? But that's the progression. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. The most interesting part of this research, in, in my opinion, wasn't the 12 steps. I find those to be incredibly helpful to provide context for how healthy human interaction occurs. The most interesting part that he found is that the speed with which people would move through all 12 steps was not really a... Uh, it was not correlated to the successfulness of that relationship. So you could start at step one, end at step 12 in the same night, and still actually wind up with a decently healthy relationship. Many of you have done this on a regular basis. <laughs> right? Some of you got the warts to prove it. Um, but the, so going on through, right? Too soon? Too early? All right. Um, making sure you're paying attention. So going on through, it, it's not the, the pace at which you move through it that matters, it's that you cannot skip a step. If you skip one step, it's aggressive. If you skip two, that's assault, brother. Right? <laughs> Funny got my move. I, pretty much, as a general rule, I like to speak in um, quotes from Billy Madison, Dumb and Dumber, um, and Black Sheep. So if you're a child of the 90s, then maybe this is going to be helpful for you. All right. So that's critical, right? So make sure as we're going through this, you can't assault your customers, all right? You cannot assault them. So this is what most marketers are doing, right? So for our first date, I was thinking we could figure out the names of our children, <sighs> right? We know we don't want to do that. We don't want to skip the steps. Important distinction, it does hurt to ask. It does hurt to ask. You ever heard the expression, it doesn't hurt to ask? Of course it hurts to ask. Of course it hurts to ask. Guys, try it tonight. Hey, nice to meet you. My name's Bob. Want to go back to my place and get freaky? Oh, just kidding. Can I buy you a drink? No, you can't go back from that. You're freaky Bob, right? <laughs> it does hurt to ask. If you get it out of order, there's no going back. And we're oftentimes asking for the order far too soon. I've been guilty, more guilty of this than I, than I even like to admit and imagine in my, in my career. And we do this. We do this a lot of times when we're optimizing for the conversion, a lot of what Heaton just talked about, dead on accurate. But I know I've been in this, in this phase, it was called 2013. I spent 2013 optimizing for each little step of the conversion. Optimizing, optimizing, okay, that one won, go, that one won, go, that one won, go, go, go. And then I looked up, it kind of took a step back and looked at all that I was creating, I was like, wow, I'm kind of an asshole. I've optimized for the conversion, I haven't optimized for the relationship. And that's important. It's really, really, really important. You all, at the same time, have people overcompensating. Just give, just give, just give, give, and then, then they'll eventually come back. No, homie, you're dead locked into the friend zone at that point. Okay? There is no getting out of the friend zone. At some point, you have to ask for the order. All right? You have to do it. So how do you not be that guy or, the, or the, that girl? Having a clear understanding of the customer journey is, is, is critical. So let's talk about that. I'll be very quick because I know some of this is review. All right, step one, awareness. How are they going to become aware of the existence of your offer? How is that going to happen? That's step one. Step two, engagement. Engagement. Step three, subscription of some sort. How do you get their number, right? How do you get their digits? Do kids even say that anymore? Probably not. Um, how do you convert them? Now, conversion, as I'm using it here, is not, probably not what you're thinking about. I'm talking about a conversion of the mind and a conversion of the heart. So we'll talk about that. Talk about what that means. How do you get them excited? How do you get them excited about what's going on? How do you then ascend them through the process? How do you turn them into an advocate, which is a form of passive promotion? And then how do you turn them into an active 
promoter. If you didn't get those down, don't worry, they will be repeated starting right now. So when we think about awareness, what we're really, let's, let's, again, let's talk about normal human relationships, right? Awareness. Anybody remember Jim Carrey, Dumb and Dumber? Orange tuxedo, right? Just gonna stand here, send out the vibes, right? How are you gonna send out the vibes, right? He's wearing an orange tuxedo, very noticeable. But you wanna make sure that the manner through which you are getting noticed does not cause people to hate you, right? That's a biggie. We wanna optimize for the relationship, not merely for that particular com conversion point. Engagement. Your leg's tired because you've been running through my mind all day long, right? I don't recommend that one as a pickup line, but having some mechanism for engaging with them once you have their attention. Here's the big question. I'm going to ask this to you again. How do you turn a glance into a stare? How do you turn a glance into a stare? Getting a glance in this day and age is easy, right? How do you get them to stare? Everybody's getting glances left and right, right? Look, it's Kim Kardashian's ass again, right? Now that sometimes may turn into a stare, but that's what you're competing against, right? How do you turn a glance into a stare? There has to be some mechanism for engagement. Subscription, what's your number? Having the ability to follow up. Having the ability to follow up, that's big. That's big. Um, convert, wanna grab some coffee sometime? It's one thing to get the number, it's another thing completely to meet up with them later. I remember I went out, um, I knew some people through, through different business settings, and uh, we wound up all meeting up at this, at this conference. And they seemed like normal guys um, when, when we were just talking and doing business stuff. But then we got out at this conference, and it was in Vegas. And I don't know what it is, but normal human beings go to Vegas and then just turn into utter whack jobs, right? And these guys, it's like the sun set, and they're like, all right, we're gonna go out. And I'm like, all right, that sounds terrible, but I guess I'll go along. Um, and I meet these guys in the lobby, and they're wearing freaking like top hats and boas and like, <laughs> like you know, they're like thinking they're these pickup artists kind of knuckleheads, right? And, and we go out, and I'm like, this is horrible. I really hate every aspect of what's going on right now. This is embarrassing. And I see them going out, and they're, and they're talking to girls, they're like, oh yeah, you know, and they're coming back like, ooh, I got her number, right? Like, okay, yeah, I did, an, I did an old number 12 on her. I got her number. Psh, and they're high five. And I'm like, this is the like, lamest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I'm going to go back, take a shower, and call my wife. Um, and they were optimizing for the subscription. Right? Merely, they, these girls probably gave them the wrong number. Right? Any of you guys ever opt into a form with a fake email address? Only probably about 90% of the time. Right? Getting the real number and, and, and an expectation that when you follow up that they're going to be excited about it, that's what happens with conversion. That's the changing the heart and mind. How do you get them excited? Clever texts, flowers, those types of things. Ascend, can I take you to dinner? That's different than meeting up for coffee. Now maybe she's still having her friend call 10 minutes in so that if it's not going so well, you know, you'd be like, oh, there's an emergency, I gotta go. Ladies, any of y'all do that? Guys? It probably wasn't an emergency if that happened to you, all right? Advocate, I think this is the one. Telling all their friends, right? I now pronounce you. Normal, ordinary human relationships. Never forget you are selling to people. So when we think about this journey, I like to visually plot it. I like to go through and, and use this form. It doesn't have to be 12 steps, right? But oftentimes they're, they're reflected you know, very differently. But I know at Digital Marketer, Awareness usually comes in the form of advertising, right? Crazy concept. Prospect sees, a, sees an ad on Facebook or Google. Oh, by the way, I'll send you these slides if you guys want them, if they're okay with it. Prospect sees an ad on Facebook and Google. The ad directs them to a high quality blog post. We found that if we drive advertising to content and deliver actual real value in advance first, while we initially get far less leads, they're much higher quality and over time our cost per lead is much lower. Okay? Because what we're doing when we drive them to content, what we're actually building is a pixeled audience. We're using retargeting, which I know you guys have already talked about here. Right? So we drive advertising to build a pixeled audience. Big, big, big deal. Been a game changer for us. That's a form of subscription though. I have the ability to follow up via retargeting. 
It's a more passive form of subscription, but it's still there. Now, in the content and in the retargeting, now we're sending them back to some type of a lead magnet. I want to actually get their number, right? I want to actually get their email address. We're driving them back to some type of a, of a lead magnet. Then on the thank you page, we're going to make an offer, right? On the thank you page, we're going to make an offer. They opted in, we're going to make them another offer. Just like, hey, wow, coffee sure has been fun. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing later on this week? You want to go grab dinner sometime? You don't have to wait an extended period of time. If it went well, that's the perfect time to go for the next level of conversion. We then uh, do thank, on the thank you page follow up. We want to get them into a, a, a $1 trial for Digital Marketer Lab. That's our subscription. A $1 trial. But notice the trial's coming pretty far down the path. Right? We've already delivered them some value in advance. Right? We've got them to download some stuff. We want to get them into that, into that trial. That still, we consider that to be a conversion. They haven't fully ascended yet. Then we're going to send them some additional follow-up emails to try to get them to ascend. Great, you're a trial member. Let's get you excited and let's have you ascend right away. How many of you are, are using trials right now? You're using trials. How many of you, if you're using trials, did any of you make an offer for immediate ascension? Or give them an opportunity to ascend prior to the trial period being over? Try that. Try that. We have found that we can get between 15 and 20% of our trial people to ascend within the first seven days. It does a couple of things. Number one, it gets you some money faster, which if you're self-funded is a big deal. Right? I want to increase immediate customer values. The other thing that it allows you to do is you're getting them when they're most excited. So putting mechanisms in place, and we'll talk about how to do this, that allow those who are a little more excited to raise their hand and say, I'm excited, and giving them an opportunity to ascend early on is a point of optimization that we'll talk about later. So I'm referencing it now. We'll come back to it later. All right? You don't have to wait. Give them an opportunity to ascend. All right? Here's the other thing that's probably a writer downer. Consumption is not a requirement for ascension. Consumption is not a requirement for ascension. Excitement is a requirement for ascension. They must be excited about and believe that it's going to work. You want to hit them when they're most excited. So we do just that. We want follow-up emails to encourage consumption for those who don't immediately ascend to get them even more excited. We're going to do more follow-up to get them again to consume, to get them more excited, even more follow-up to get them to, to post, to get some little victories, which I'll talk about. And then eventually after the 30 days, if they haven't elected to ascend, that's when the trial ends. Now they have fully ascended. Now everything's about getting them to stay. Marketing doesn't stop when the sale is made. Marketing doesn't stop when the sale is made. Making a sale is great, keeping it's even better. And then after 90 days, that's when we try to get them to become a promoter. We're not going to ask them to promote too soon. They don't know us well enough yet. Again, it does hurt to ask. This is just an example one. Again, I'll send it up there, but I'm showing you this so you can do it for yours. There's another, I'll call them Acme CRM. It's another uh, you know, large CRM company that I, that I advise for. Here's one that I built for them. Search ads, social ads, content distribution networks. That's what they use to create awareness. They're also sending that content to a relevant blog post to build a pixeled audience. They're making a relevant, uh, they're, they're doing a relevant lead magnet, but here's the other thing that they're doing. In the lead magnet, when somebody's downloading a report or something like that, they have a little checkbox on there that says, yes, I would also like to see a demo so I can learn how to put insert lead magnet name to use utilizing insert software name. You got it? You hear what I just said there? The checkbox is a mechanism on the, and I'm, and I'm sorry I can't show you the actual example because of, of uh, confidentiality things, but somebody opts in for a lead magnet, a special report of some sort, right? Maybe it's an, maybe it's an email campaign. Then there's a checkbox right there on the page where they can check it and say, yes, I would like to learn how to put the Mega Super Ultra Awesome campaign to use utilizing Acme CRM. 
The people that check that, they get an opportunity to ascend much faster. They have chosen their own adventure. All right? Having little things along the way to give them this opportunity is critical. We then make them what we call a relevant entry point offer. All right, what's an entry point offer? I'm giving these, these examples right now as a foundation. We're gonna come back and get into a little more specifics. I just want, don't feel like you have to understand the basis of this. I just want you to feel, like, kind of feel the, the, the flow of how it's going. So they just opted in for a lead magnet, you know, so it's a special report, some bit of content that is about a specific subject. Now we're going to say, hey, how would you, how would you like us to really implement this for you? We'll do that for you if you'll come and do a demo. We'll do it for you if you do a demo. Oftentimes, when we're building out our funnels, we don't reference the previous action that the user took. So, for example, if they opted in for a lead magnet about, and this is a CRM, let's say they opted in for a lead magnet that's about lead scoring. Okay? How to, how to score your leads to make your sales team, to make your sales floor more efficient. If they opted in for something about lead scoring, then what should you do the demo on? What should the demo be about? Lead scoring. What most are doing is they're doing a general demo. Hey, great, you're interested in this stuff. Come on, let's do a demo. And they talk about everything. No, no, no. Reference, hey, I see that you signed up for something about lead scoring. Let's talk about how you do lead scoring with this. You can come back and talk about all your other features, but you gotta prioritize based on what they said. Always reference the previous positive action. Follow-up emails are designed to get them to actually show up for the demo, generate that excitement. You're, they perform the demo, which generates more excitement because the demo is being performed, like I said, about the thing that they're most interested in. You're utilizing that entry point, that gated content, to inform the sales process. They then upsell into a trial, and then everything else is about trying to get them to actually utilize the stuff and, and go through the trial. All right, So that's the basic flow of how that works. We're going to talk more detailed in just, in just a little bit, but I just want you to kind of see the flow of how this goes. And I'm going to recommend at the end that you build one of these for your brand, all right, for your particular offer. And I'll get you this. You, you can either use this fancy worksheet or you can use a sheet of paper. Whiteboards also work, all right? Thinking through the flow. And there's nothing magical about 12 boxes. That's just what fit on the page. And that's something that we use a lot of times. So that's thinking through sequence, all right? We're gonna keep touching on sequence, but thinking through sequence is critical. Look at your process. Does it feel like you're being a little pervy? Or does it feel like you're being a little prude, all right? Think about it like a human relationship. Let's talk about messaging. Does the copy, and this is especially critical for top of funnel content, top of funnel copy, speak to a specific desired end result? A specific desired end result. For the love of God, be specific. And I know Andre touched on this, but it's worth repeating. Specificity is so unbelievably critical. So not this, right? Get free updates. And my 20 week e-course. Yay, I'm gonna get email for 20 weeks. Marketing 101. Basic stuff for 20 weeks. Yay. Right? Trials have their purpose. Trials are good. Trials are not lead magnets. Trials are, they're gonna come and check you out. Right? But there's no actual value being delivered there. The end result of a trial is I know more about this thing and maybe I'll give them money. Right? It's too soon to be used as a lead magnet. And also things like this. Introductory guide how to use landing pages for your business. I see this all the time. There's no specificity there. How to use landing pages. Doesn't really paint a picture, right? <laughs> We're staying on the PG-13 kind of thing because, uh, I don't know. Um, this, is, this is what happens when you get married early, I suppose. So there was a book that was published in the 1980s by Nora Hayden called Astrological Love. All right, anybody buy it, read it? Did you really? You started to raise your hand though. I think you did. Okay. So it was published in the 1980s, uh, Astrological Love. Didn't sell particularly well, went out of print. Um, I believe it's because it was called Astrological Love, right? No one wakes up in the morning and thinks to themselves, you know what, I really wish I could love more astrologically. We don't think that, right? We don't think that. That's not the desired end result. Interestingly enough, she republished virtually the exact same book, exact same content, 
about 10 years later under a new title. And that title was How to Satisfy a Woman Every Time and Have Her Beg for More. <laughs> now I ask you, which would you rather have? Would you rather, you know, ladies, you know, want your man to love more astrologically, whatever the hell that is, or satisfy a woman every time and have her beg for more? The first book went out of print, the second one went on to sell two and a half million copies. All right? New York Times bestseller. Because it spoke to the desired end result of both markets, by the way. Guys that wanted that and women who were like, read this, right? <laughs> Speak to the desired end result. We do this all the time. We get way too clever with our top of funnel content. Way too clever. HubSpot, and I know this is, I know this is small. Again, I'm, I, it's just small, and if I expand it, it'll be, it'll be blurry, but you'll get this in the slides, and I'll, I'll read it to you. A couple years back, they published, here were, here were our best performing, our top performing lead magnets, right? Number one was five infographic templates in PowerPoint. Very specific. Want to make an infographic? Here are a bunch of templates in PowerPoint. 114,000 downloads. Number two, 53 examples of brilliant homepage design. Again, very specific. Specific in the numbers, 53, homepage design. If you want to know how to design a homepage, here you go. 53 examples for you. Now, still in the top, I think, six, but rounding out the bottom, you had how to use landing pages for business. Now, I'm not knocking HubSpot. They're a brilliant company. They, they have brilliant marketers working there, right? But no one wakes up in the morning and says, yeah, I wish I'd, somebody would show me how to better use landing pages for business. They don't say that. They don't use those terms. That's not the words that they speak in, okay? That's not what they do. They, say, they might say how to get more leads for your business. Same topic, you're using landing pages to get more leads. Speak to the actual desired end result. What is the actual desired end result? What are the words and phrases that they are using? And then this one, with only 7,855 downloads, the anatomy of a five-star email. The anatomy of a five-star email. We are all guilty of doing this. The anatomy of a five-star email. What the hell is that? What is a five-star email? Anybody know? Does it just paint a picture in the mind? Right? No. Doesn't, doesn't even remotely paint a picture in the mind. I don't know what it is. Learn the 12 components of a five-star email. Well, I guess now I know there are 12, yay. Um, in this download, you'll also find a one-page printout that you can reference when you craft your emails. Wait a minute, it comes with a one-page printout? Yeah, I mean, if it were one-page cheat sheet for crafting the perfect email that gets more opens, it gets more clicks, now you got something. Speaking to a desired end result. So oftentimes this is not about coming up with whole new lead magnets, it's about speaking to the specific thing that's in there that people actually want. We're all guilty of this, including me. This is one of ours, one of, our, one of the markets that we're in is in the homesteading space, right? In, in that space, vertical gardening is a really big deal, right? Vertical gardening. So we wanted to put out a lead magnet, a special report to get people who are interested and excited about vertical gardening. So here was the original title of the report. Growing up, the ins and outs of up and down gardening. Get it? Get it? Growing up, vertical gardening, ins and outs, up and down. Ah, ah, get it? Nobody wanted it. Like, what the hell is that? When we changed the title to how to grow enough food to feed a family of four in just four square feet of space, even if you don't have a yard, that is a $10 million company today. Because we stopped being clever. And we simply spoke to the actual desired end result. We spoke to the language that they are using, not what we think is cute and clever. And we do this all the time. Which is more compelling? This is our friends at, um, at, at uh, uh, Social Media Examiner. Get our latest articles delivered to your email inbox and get the free Facebook marketing video tutorial. Yay, it's a video tutorial on Facebook marketing. You know, again, I, this was a broad-based lead magnet. I get it, I'm not hating on him. Michael is a, is a friend. But I think ours is better. Case study, how we generated 250 leads from Facebook in 18 hours without spending a dime on advertising. Now that is a Facebook marketing video tutorial. It's just specific. Specific, see that? 
Shop, it's not a Shopify store, it's a Facebook store. So if you're selling software and you'd be thinking, yeah, this doesn't apply to me, I don't do special reports, all they're doing is plucking out a feature. When you get a Shopify store, one of the things that you can do is launch a Facebook store. It's built into the program. They plucked out a feature and said, okay, here's how you want, want to launch a Facebook store? Yeah, sure, I'll launch a Facebook store. Great, sign up for Shopify. How about WordPress? You want to launch a WordPress store? Yep, I'd love to launch a WordPress store. Awesome, sign up for Shopify. We got a WordPress thing too. They got another lead magnet that's uh, for photographers. Photographers, sell your photography, launch a Shopify store. It's specific. Specific, and you can do it with the exact same product, just highlight an individual feature. Highlight individual feature. Any you guys watch, see the movie Napoleon Dynamite? Right? Anybody remember Pedro's vote for Pedro? Why? Why should you vote for Pedro? What's he gonna do? He's gonna make all your wildest dreams come true. Vote for Pedro, I'll make all your wildest dreams come true. That's what, many of you, that's what you're doing. Buy my product, I'll make all your wildest dreams come true. What the fuck? No. Get specific. Specific, specific, specific. All right? Here's a good exercise that you can go through right now to, to start writing better copy, even if you're not a copywriter. All right? This is your prospect. This is Mr. Before. And Mr. Before is unhappy because Mr. Before does not know that you, your product, or your service exists yet. All right? That's why they're sad and miserable. All right? This is Mr. After. Same person, the difference is they now know that your product or service exists. That's why they're happy. Okay? Never forget that in business, I don't care what business you're in, we get paid to move people from a before state to an after state. It's all we are ever doing. We are moving them from a before state to the after state. Now the distance between the before state and the after state is what determines value. Think about doctors. Dead? Not dead. <laughs> I would argue they should get paid better, right? Teachers. Dumb? Less dumb. All right? What is the before and after state that you move people through? That is the thing that you get paid to do. All right? That is the reason that you get paid. You get paid to shift human beings from a before state to the after state. Now that, and at the end of the day, copywriting, good copywriting, good marketing, that's all we're doing. We're articulating this shift from before to after. We're simply articulating the shift from the before state to the after state. And to the extent that we can speak to where they are, hey, right now you're here, but after you have my product, you'll be here, we'll become better marketers. Copywriting is really, really, really simple. This is the before and after grid. This is how you learn to begin to speak in terms of the after. All right? So when we think about before and after, I break this up into four categories. The first category is have. Have. What do they have before that they don't have after? You're selling pimple cream? Before you got pimples? After? No pimples. Got it? Or what don't they have before that they do have after? This is classic features and benefits. What do they have before that they don't have after? All right? Create this grid, brainstorm it with your team. This, by the way, is where most marketers stop. They stop at have. They stop at have. I'm gonna suggest you go to the next one, feel. What is their emotional state before? What is their emotional state after? How many of you have heard that you need to learn, that you need to write with more emotion in your copy? Right, anybody heard of this? I don't, and I don't care what you're selling, you know? Invoking emotion into copy is critical. But how do you do it in a way that feels naturally? You have to know. How do they feel before? Are they frustrated? Are they angry? Are they tired? Are they happy, but they could be more happier, right? What is it? What is that? What is that thing? How do they feel? This is how you begin to bring emotion into the copy. Average day. What is their average day like before? What is their average day like after? Average day before, average day after. This is how we can begin to bring narrative into our copy. Narrative into our copy. Give you an example. And, and I'm, I'm giving you guys examples of offline brick and mortar businesses that we all know, but I want you to apply how does it work for there. So let's say I'm a landscaper, all right? I own a landscaping company. Now, if I own a landscaping company, the way that I want to talk to my customers, I want to say, look, this is how you, tell me if this sounds familiar. 
you wake up in the morning and it's Saturday. And you woke up not because you wanted to wake up, you woke up because your alarm went off. Now, why would you set an alarm on a Saturday? We well, you'd set an alarm on a Saturday because you have to mow your grass. And if you don't wake up early, it's gonna be scorching hot, you're gonna be sweating to death. So you wake up early, you go out to your garage, you pull down the lawnmower from the thing, you get a gas tank, but what's wrong with the gas tank? It's empty. So now, you put a gas tank in your car and you drive to the gas station. Your car smells like gas, you come back, you're an hour behind already. Fill up the gas tank, rung, rung, rung. sun's high up in the sky, you're sweating like a pig. You finally get it done after, a, many, many, after a couple of hours, you're wiped out, you lay down on the couch, Saturday is over. Saturday is over. Now after, if you have us do it, you can wake up whenever you wanna wake up. We're gonna show up, we're gonna mow your grass, we're probably gonna do it during the week while you're not there so you just get to enjoy your weekend. So while all your other friends are out there mowing their lawn, you get to kick back and enjoy your Saturday. We're Acme Landscaping. We don't just mow lawns. We deliver Saturdays. See what I just did there? Anybody on a landscaping company? If so, you're freaking welcome, all right? <laughs> so but that's how we do that, right? How do we speak to that? Now this is even better if, it, if it's not hypothetical. You have these customer stories right now if you've been in business for any, any length of time. Don't make it up, tell their stories. Some of the best marketing in the world is case studies. I was here, then my day was like this and it was awful and then it was here, got it? All of these things make great copy. And then status. What is their status before and their status after? Napoleon Bonaparte said, I've made the most wonderful discovery. Men will fight long and hard, even die for a bit of colored ribbon. Status. Can you give your people more status? If you're a SaaS company, right? If you're a SaaS company and you're, you're turning somebody into a little like marketing ninja or insert name slash ninja here, right? Or rock star, whatever. They're gonna become, talk to them, not about how great your software is, talk to them about how it's gonna make them more valuable, right? Know who your buyers are. Before and after grid. This is where your copy chunks can come from. If you will go through this exercise, writing copy becomes very, very, very simple. All right, is that helpful? Yeah. Good. Let's talk about commitment. How can we deploy micro commitments? How can you lock them into the process through micro commitments? You've all hopefully read Influence by Robert Cialdini, right? You understand the idea of commitment and consistency? I hope so, if not, read it, good book. There's two types of commitments. Two types of commitments. The first one, people show commitments with their wallet. We show commitment with our wallet. How many of you remember this? Anybody old enough to remember this? I know some of you are. Some of you are freaking old as dirt in here. Good for you, by the way. Columbia House Records, right? Columbia House Records. Give us a dollar, we'll send you a metric butt ton of eight tracks. Tapes, CDs, right? They knew when you sent that dollar in, the relationship was fundamentally changed. You were now a customer. Yes, it was only a dollar. If you never bought another CD, they would lose some money. Right? Now, I'm not suggesting that you do this to like, shove people into some kind of forced continuity shenanigans. Right? Understand that if you can get someone to give you even a small amount of money, the relationship is fundamentally changed. Just like if you can get someone to meet you for coffee, as low as that commitment is, the relationship is fundamentally changed. You're now dating. You are literally on a date. Okay? You were literally on a date. Speaking of that, that's the next way that people show commitment, is in their calendar. Wallet and calendar. Wallet and calendar. If you are not impacting one of those two places, it is not a true commitment. They can bail out at any time. Wallet and calendar. How are you going to be asking them to give you a little bit more of their time? Webinars are awesome for this. I talked earlier about giving people an opportunity to ascend earlier on in your trial process. Do you, do you know how you do that? How we've done this in the past? Host a webinar. Host a webinar. We're going to do a, you know, a special training webinar just for, just for new signups. We're going to be talking about some super amazing, awesome stuff. The reality is the topic is irrelevant. Give some good stuff, but the topic isn't particularly important. What you want to know is who are the people that are committed enough that they'll give you some more of their time. When on that webinar you say, hey, great, you know, as a special bonus for everyone who's on this webinar today, you know, since I know most of you are still in a trial, if you want to go ahead and upgrade today, here's what we're going to give you when you sign up. Now, the people that didn't show up for the webinar, they don't have as much commitment, so they never saw that offer. They remember when I said before, it does hurt to ask? In this case, you're making an offer to people who have, they've self-selected, they've raised their hand and said, I, I think I might want this. 
Okay? Great time to make an offer. How can you build that into your funnel? How can you, and, and it's ideal to be used during the trial phase. It's ideal to be used during the trial phase. Got it? There's a little tactical thing. Demos. Demos are great for this. If somebody's willing to show up for a demo, that's, that's a conversion. They have no expectation of any actual benefit. You know, best case scenario, they wind up buying stuff that they think is going to help them. More than likely, it's just a waste of everybody's time. All right? Demo. This is where want to get some coffee. Right? How can you ask your customers, your prospects, on a regular basis, hey, let's meet up. Let's go get some coffee. When somebody says to you, oh, I'm sorry, I just don't have time, that's not true. They do have time. They have the exact same amount of time that you have. What they're really saying is, ah, oh, I'm sorry, you're just not as much of a priority in my life. Sad but true, right? With everything I got going on, like I don't have time to be here right now. I got 4,000 some odd people who are going to show up in a hotel room in a couple of days, and spoiler alert, I have no idea what the hell I'm going to talk about. All right? I got to figure that out, and I actually do. That's not totally true. But I'm not as prepared as I would like to be. I don't have time to be here, but I'm here because it's a priority. How can you get them during the process to show that, yes, your product, your service is a priority in their life? And when they do that, that's when you ask them to ascend. That's when you ask them to do that. You don't just ask them to ascend. No, I don't want to do that right now. Once they've said no, no is bad. Once we say no, we rarely change our minds and say yes. We don't like to change our minds. We're human beings. We're always right. So how can you get a micro commitment where you then do an ask and then and only then, that's when you have an opportunity for ascension. You want to protect that core offer. Protect it. Protect it. Some examples. In the survival and preparedness space, we sell this thing called the Everstrike Match. All right? It's a waterproof mat match. This is something that, these are things that people want but don't necessarily need. What can you offer to your audience that is something that they would want but don't necessarily need? This shows that they are expressing buying intent. Buying intent. Uh, at, at Digital Marketer this year, we ran a Black Friday sale. That makes no damn sense. That it worked, crushed. Hey, we're running a Black Friday sale. What does it have to do with anything? Nothing. But the reality is, at that time of the year, everybody's walking around, wallet out, buying stuff. They're buying stuff for other people, they're gonna buy stuff for them as well. How do you pluck out the people who have some type of buying intent? Get them to make a small micro purchase. We do this, we're in the menswear space. We sell custom suits, but we don't sell custom suits. That's hard. We sell cufflinks. Actually, we give away cufflinks. Want some cufflinks? Here you go. There's not cufflinks. Now, if you want cufflinks, I don't, what do you probably own? You probably own a suit. You probably actually own a French cuffed shirt. If not, you're really confused about the function of a cufflink. <laughs> so we got a lot of people who own suits and a lot of people who are just total idiots. Um, but if you own that, right, we know the purchase informs their intent. What's something that you can put out to your market that will inform their intent? It doesn't even have to be your core offering. It doesn't have to be your core offer. Go out to somebody else who's selling something super cool, right? Partner with them, joint venture with them. Say, hey, I want to sell your stuff to my audience. It's lower price, lower barrier to entry, but put me on the back end of this purchase funnel because if they buy this, then there's a good chance they need my stuff. It doesn't have to be your product. But splinter something out if you got it. Splinter something out if you got it. That's why HubSpot launched a CRM. Here you go, free CRM. Take it. You need a CRM, you probably need our core product over here. Right? You guys can all do this. Want but don't need. Want but don't need. Here's another one. Something they need, but that isn't particularly sexy. My business partner became one of the, he became the third largest candle manufacturer in the, in the United States, which is a big deal, by the way, uh, because he sold candle wicks. He went out to the audience and said, hey, candle wicks for sale. You want some freaking candle wicks? I got all the candle wicks you want at the best price. Now, has anyone ever bought a replacement wick for a candle? Nope. <laughs> if you're buying a candle wick, you're probably going to make a candle. Right? So here's the wicks. Take the wicks. Want to buy some wicks? Here's some wicks. Hey, since you bought some wicks, 
uh, you want some like wax and fragrance oil and some of that other stuff too? Oh yeah, you know what, I do need that. That'd be awesome. Okay, here you go. What's your candle wick? What is your candle wick? Same with guitar picks. Giving you broad examples, things that we should all know. I want you to decide what is the wick and guitar pick for your offer. What's something that your audience needs but doesn't necessarily want or have to get. Now we know that we have market relevance. Market relevance. That's our guy. I know I got a guitar player. You know why? They just bought a metric butt ton of guitar picks. I've never bought a guitar pick in my life. You know why? Don't play guitar. All right? Webinars. I love webinars. They're a time suck. It's just a good thing. You want them to do that. You want them to have that investment. Do regular webinars. Okay? Don't just email out to your list saying, how about now? How about now? How about now? How about now? Do you want my thing? No? How about now? How about now? How about now? Engage them with content. It's a sign of intent. Then make the offer. And I love trials. I think trials are fantastic, but be careful when you make them. If you make a trial too soon, you will get lower quality people, your churn rate's gonna be high, and you're gonna spend a whole lot of money and not make it back. Just like occasionally, you might go up to somebody and be like, hey, wanna go back to my place to get freaky? The one that's like, yeah, sure. That's probably not the one you want. <laughs> You know you've got this right when you're scared. Good friend of mine, really a truly legendary mar marketer by the name of Roy Williams. Um, he's big in the radio space. I study offline stuff because I'll tell you, offline's freaking hard. If they made it work offline, they're sharp. Roy Williams built a campaign for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. 1-800-GOT-JUNK, they were just going through this thing like, hey, you got some junk? Come on out, we're 100, got junk. We'll come in and pick up all that junk for you. Right? That was their standard offer. Got some junk? We'll get rid of it. He went around and said, did you get one of those fancy new flat screen TVs for, you know, for Christmas or a birthday recently? Well, how would you like us to come out and pick up the old, uh, the old TV that's just gathering dust? We're 100, got junk, and for just 20 bucks, we'll send a crew of guys out, haul off your TV. We'll do it just for 20 bucks. Now that's scary. When he proposed this to the folks at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, they said, you're out of your mind. We're going to lose all kinds of money. Send, we got to send two guys. We can't just send one for liability reasons. Send two guys a truck, and cost us more than gas to pick up a single TV. But what Roy knew, and what thankfully this company was sharp enough to realize, is that if somebody still hasn't gotten rid of an old funky TV, guess what? They probably got some other junk laying around. Probably got some other junk laying around. So, Hey, I noticed while you're here, you want us to do another quote? We're already here. We're already here. You know you've got it right when you're a little bit scared. When you're a little bit scared, you know you're given true value in advance. All right? When you're a little bit scared. I realize most of you aren't in the junk hauling business. So what is the I'll pick up the TV for you for only 20 bucks? All right? What is that thing? Are you, gonna, are you gonna be willing to do a data migration for them, right? What is that for no, almost nothing? What are you willing to do for free that everybody else is charging big money for? Because you want the customer. What is that thing? Finally, little victories. Does the funnel encourage little victories that drive consumption and advocacy? Two really quick examples here and then I'll try to take some questions. I was talking to somebody at Constant Contact. They found that when they were onboarding new customers, their, their first step was, okay, step one. Let's, let's import your list. Step one, let's import your list. That's hard. Lots of friction, lots of resistance. But from their perspective, they're like, well, that's step one in the process. Got to do it. Can't do anything else in our system until they've got a list in there, so we got to do it first. They changed it. They had the recognition that just because their step one was to import the list, it wasn't the prospect's step one. So they changed it to, all right, so now that we got you in here, you know, one of the best features in eye contact is we can customize your emails for you, make them look real purdy. So let's go in, let's, uh, let's grab your, your logo, let's drop that in there, fantastic. You know, what do you think you might want to say in your welcome mail? You know, ch -ch 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 -ch. okay, yeah, oh, that's oh, genius. Wow, you're, you know, freaking Hemingway. Oh, beautiful, love it, love it, love it. Okay, now we got, the, uh, we got this first email formatted and written. You know, what do you think? You like it? Yeah, love it. Woo, high five. Psh. All right, who are we going to send it to? Oh, now we got to get the list in. 
But the little victory that it established, they feel good about it. I did something, yay! Oftentimes, the very first thing that you want somebody to do is something that is a pain in the ass. Don't have them do that first. Give, give them a little win. Give them a little win. Give them a taste. It doesn't have to be all the way. You're not moving them all the way down the before and after continuum. You're just moving them a step. But at this point, hope is all they need. Hope. Give them a hope reset. Give them a hope reset. Because the moment that they bought, that was, they will never be more excited about it than that particular moment. They bought. They gave money. Now, as far as they're concerned, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Then they find out, oh, crap, this thing's going to take some work. Right? I, I've signed up for a lot of gym memberships. It doesn't mean I went. Right? Bought equipment online. Woo, yeah, I'm going to get in shape. Equipment gets there like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Right? How can you give them that little win? More importantly, how can you teach it so that the little win becomes a source of advocacy? I recently bought a Tesla. I'm almost embarrassed to admit that because previously I was, uh, my other car, I had to pay like a gas tax on it. I was like, yeah, take that, Earth. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I was like, I don't know. I don't want to do all like that, be, be kind of that guy with the Tesla or whatever. But then they came out with the P90D with the ludicrous speed. And I was like, it's ludicrous speed. I have to get that. So I went up there to do a test drive. And when I'm doing the test drive in the Tesla, I'm kind of putting around. You know, you're doing a test drive. It's a little bit nervous. It's not your car yet. It's unfamiliar to you. And so I'm driving around like, yeah, this is nice. And the test driver, you know, salesman's like, okay, you know, yeah, you like it? Yeah, I think it's cool. He's like, okay, before we go back to the dealership, I want to do something. Let's pull off to this back road. We're going to do a launch. And you guys been launched in the Tesla, right? So when you come to a complete stop and then just slam your foot on the, on the pedal, on the accelerator, you just slam it, pedal metal, boom. So he's like, we're going to do a launch. He's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. All right, I want you to go over here. And I want you just to floor it. Slam it. And the first time I did it, it was like, eh. I kind of stutter stepped. I was like, oh, wow, that's great. He's like, no, 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 that wasn't good enough. Do it again. I mean it. I want you to take your foot about four inches away from the pedal, and I want you to slam it down as hard as you can. You know? Right? He's like, yeah, see, there you go. OK, boom. Little victory. Right? I am now obviously car god. And uh, but furthermore, what do you, when I got, took delivery, what do you think is the first thing that I wanted to do with all my friends? Hey, come on, come and drive another car. <laughs> and he'd be like, hey, what's that on the ground? <laughs> um, right? They're teaching advocacy. And he would not let me do it wrong. What's your launch? What's the thing that's so unbelievably super cool that makes you look like a magician, that makes your customer look like a magician that they then want to show other people? What is that for you? What is your launch? So next step. Build your customer journey. Do it. Document it. Share it with your team. Make sure that they know. Also, do the before and after grid. That's where you can pull all your copy from. B and C level copywriters can produce fantastic copy if they have that before and after grid. And when you do that, be sure you have good answers to the following questions. Question number one, how will you get their attention? How will you put out the vibes? All right. Make sure it's not an orange tuxedo that makes you look like a weirdo. How are you, you going to put out the vibes? How will you get their attention? Question number two, how will you turn a glance into a stare? How will you turn a glance into a stare? What value first opportunity are you going to deliver? Are they going to show up? And you're just going to be like, hey, what's up? Right? Or are you going to actually deliver value in advance? Retargeting is the key to this. Big brands know that this is essential. Big brands are willing to wait because big brands got big piles of money. When you're first getting started, you don't, but thankfully, Retargeting makes it such that you can spend and still be able to follow up even if you don't have their email address. You can deliver real actual value in advance through great, amazing, educational or entertaining content. But you know that since they came there, they're kind of digging on your chili, right? Question number three, how are you going to get their number? Specificity is essential. How will you get their number? How will you get their number? Question number four, how will you get them to show commitment? How are you going to build these micro commitments into your process? It's a big, big aspect of funnel optimization. If you look through and you don't have a place where they have the opportunity to commit along the, along the way, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. You went out. You had a great first date. You never called them back. You never asked them to go out. They've moved on. How are you going to get them to recommit? Wallet or calendar? Wallet or calendar? 
What little victory will you offer that will encourage them to ascend? I told you the, the email template thing with, with eye contact, the Tesla story. I have a buddy of mine who's in the fitness space. And what he has people do is really hard and it takes a long time for them to see any benefits. So the very first thing that he has them do is a seven day juice fast. Because if you do a seven day juice fast, you look thinner because you are thinner because you just purged a bunch of water weight. And he'll tell you, look, you're just losing water, but it kind of is a reset and all this other stuff. But it's a little victory. People physically feel thinner. They feel like they can do it. They've also put themselves through a little mini hell. And so now they're ready to endure the thing that he's got waiting for them. Make sense? What's your juice fast? What's your Tesla launch? What's your let's design your email template for you? And then how are you going to teach them to advocate? Specifically, thinking it through strategically early on in the process. You're not going to ask them to do it yet, but you're going to teach them. You're going to teach them how they will ultimately do it one day. Make sense? That's all I got. Thank you guys. Um,